The first scripture reading we'll do in unison. It's Isaiah 65, 17 to 25. Let us begin. For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it or the cry of distress. No more shall there be at it an infant that lives but a few days or an old person who does not live at a lifetime. For one who dies at a hundred years will be considered a youth and one who falls short of a hundred will be considered accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be offspring blessed by the Lord and their descendants as well. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, but the serpent, its food, shall be dust. They shall not hunt or destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. How are you this morning? So I have a picture can you tell me what, what it's of? What animals do you see? A wolf and and some sheep, some, some lambs, right? Some babies. What's weird about that? Because the wolf isn't eating the sheep exactly, right? So we just read a passage in Scripture that talks about a, a day when the wolf and the sheep or the lambs will be able to sit together and <laughs> the wolf will not be hungry for lamb, right? A day of peace, right? And when, when everybody gets along and there's no fighting. And I remembered that I had this book and it's called We Played Marbles uh, by uh, Trace Seymour. Um, and we just, we had a holiday on, uh, on Friday. You know what it was? Veterans Day. It's people who have served in the military. And I thought this is a book about, about peace. Um, but it also acknowledges, you know, that after, um, oh, that actually this makes me think of a, of, of a story of a friend of mine. She was saying that, that her husband, John, who I went to seminary with was sitting on the ground playing with his nephews. And they had the, those little Soldiers, little green soldiers, have you seen those? And they were playing, they were playing war, right? And then John got on, on, on the floor with them. He said, okay, now the war, the war is over. We're going to play friends, right? So after, so there's a time, there's a time for peace. So this is, uh, this is kind of a true story. We played marbles on our uh, Papa's farm which is another way of like saying a grandpa, Papa's farm, on the high dirt mounds of old Fort Craig, left over from the Civil War. Civil War was a war that we had in this country, right, many, many years ago. And take it, make sure, ooh, this is going to be fun. All right. <laughs> make sure you look at the clouds because there's pictures in the clouds, right? Where hard, round rebel bullets need, used to pass Union bullets in the air. The, the rebel bullets were those were uh, the soldiers from the south, and the Union were the soldiers from the north. We rode a pony. His name was Bob. Down the steep green banks of Old Fort Craig, where the cavalry came rushing into barking guns, and Colonel Smith fell off his horse, just like me. Did you see? We made mud pies on Old Fort Craig, salted with rocks and sweetened with hay where men in blue sat in the cold light in the morning river fog and ate a watchful, worried breakfast of old biscuits and warm water. 
you see in the water? We ran foot races on the long, slow slope leading up to Old Fort Craig, like the charge of Mississippi Gray that shouted rebel yells to beat the band until the guns shouted louder. We chewed on grass stalks in the summer sun, lying on our backs on Old Fort Craig, looking at the old Green River Bridge our great-great-great-grandfather built that caused all the fighting in the first place. The battle that happened here was to, to protect that bridge. We threw a softball on the top of Old Fort Craig, and home base was the twisted giant tree a cannonball had smashed clear through. Do you see? Papa says the cannon got left after the battle at the bottom of the pond. We played soldiers shooting stick guns and waving stick swords on old Fort Craig, just like those people dressed in blue and gray. The fighters in the north wore blue and the fighters in the south wore gray. Till Papa came out and said to quit. He didn't say you'll hurt yourselves like anybody else would say. He just took an old round bullet from his pocket and he said, I know a better game. So we played marbles. And this is a note from the author. In September 1862, a great battle of the Civil War took place near Munfordville, Kentucky at Fort Craig. 4,000 Union soldiers kept back an entire Confederate army for three days to protect the Green River Bridge before surrendering. Over 300 people were hurt and some died. Fort Craig still stands quiet and peaceful now and covered with grass on a farm near Mudfordville. Children have played marbles there using old bullets as shooters for many years. Right? So this whole idea of, of peace, the wolf lying down with the lamb, and for all of us getting along is really God's dream for all of us. Shall we say a prayer? Let's fold our hands, close our eyes, bow our heads. Dear Lord, thank you for times of peace. Thank you for times of peace within us. Lord, we pray for peace in our homes, on our streets, in this nation, and across the world. Lord, help us to be peacemakers in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see your smiling faces here on a dreary day. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about what our former mesh group, our little meshy family, has been up to about bringing a different type of ministry to Grace Church since we will no longer be working under the mesh umbrella. Um, last week we had the opportunity to go to the New Christ Church in Rockaway. It's a huge, huge building. And we met with Sandy there. Three of us went, Irene and myself and Len Smith. And they have a Christ Church in Montclair as well. So we've been partners with them for many years, long before I joined MeSH. And we, went, we wanted to do some brainstorming and ask some questions and see how they ran things up there. So we went and we had a big tour of the building and it was really unbelievable all of the activities that they do there. And I think that we'll be able to share some of that information as we move along. Um, we went out to lunch and then we really started brainstorming. And one of the things we came up with is that the, those at Christchurch, they were the first ones to open their doors during the pandemic to allow the guests to come in and eat inside. Before that, we were serving in the parking lot for two years. Um, then we, Grace Church allowed us to open up our doors to feed our guests here, inside, in the warmth, with a bathroom handy and meals, regular meals, and Mesh, the mesh group now is only doing grab and go meals. So there's no sitting down and no warmth, 
no place to get away, no place to get inside. So what we've come up with, and we're going to work together as a team, we're going to come up starting serving on Sundays because that doesn't go coordinate with the regular mesh meals. They serve, only serve through Saturday. So this would be an advantage to us because we'll be able to serve on a Sunday, have our guests come back. We're going to alternate churches. We're going to start on in January, and we're going to serve at Christ Church first. And how that works is they usually will cook the meal, and then our group will go and bring whatever toiletries and stuff like that we have, and we serve the food for them. And we have a fellowship time. We always pray before the meal. We get to see our friends again and that know us by name, and we know them by name, and they'll come up and say, Joan, who made this meal today? <laughs> and you always have to let them know because they, they say, oh, it's wonderful, it's fabulous, it was so great. Please let them know. So you see, just little things like that, they're very appreciative. So we're going to start one, one, Saturday, one Sunday a month and see how it goes, and we hope to be able to expand it and we will be having people come here. We'll be doing, um, we'll hope to still have our movie time, perhaps do some games on the side for them to interact with one another because this is, this is their community time, being able to sit inside, be served with dignity, enjoy the company of others. And we're very excited to get this moving. So this is our first little development. As things move ahead, we'll keep you informed Please pray for us. And here we are, the friends of grace. So, and we hope to get a lot more friends in here. Okay, thanks so much. Have a great day. God bless you. Our second scripture lesson comes from 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 through 13. Now we command you, beloved, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from believers who are living in idleness, and not according to the tradition that they received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us. We were not idle when we were with you, and we did not eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we worked night and day so that we might not burden any of you. This was not because we do not have that right, but in order to give you an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this command, Anyone unwilling to work should not eat. For we hear that some of you are living in idleness, mere busybodies, not doing any work. Now such persons we command and exhort in the, in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Brothers and sisters, do not be weary in doing what is right. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Anyone unwilling to work should not eat. Okay, everybody look busy. Someone bought me a, a sweatshirt from, from my church in Wharton. Somebody saw the sweatshirt that made them think of me, and it said, when Jesus comes, look busy. And it's because I, the Matthew 25 passage, the, the separation of the sheep and the goats, where you know, they question Jesus, when, did you, when, did, you know, you, when you did it for the least of these, you did it for me, and it's feed the hungry, uh, give uh, drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, uh, visit those no visit those in prison take care of the sick and welcome the stranger ah, all right there's six things and i said if if you practically pragmatically if you want to know what to do here's here's a here's a list of things these are the things you want to get caught doing when jesus comes that's not necessarily the work that is being referred to here in second thessalonians but the whole idea of jesus coming again is very much a part of this passage First Thessalonians, we believe, was written by Paul, the apostle, and there was ur greater urgency about Jesus' second coming. 
Second Thessalonians, we believe, is written later, probably not written by Paul, but by a, a disciple of Paul, somebody who, who knew him well. In modern times, we're like, what? That's a lawsuit, right? Back then, it was common, and nobody blinked an eye. If, you, if the person who wrote it believed that Paul would have no problem with it, then they would sign his name to it. So there's that. First Thessalonians, there's a more of an urgency that Jesus is coming. Second Thessalonians is more of a keep on keeping on while we're waiting. In the early church, people lived in community and pooled their resources. But as time went on, it was harder for them to be on their best behavior. Can just imagine like when you're being really good and really good and you can only be so good for so long, right? Pastor Carla Sabe Stockton notes that people have short attention spans, human nature. And people's ability or will to imitate Christ can wane. And we see that happen as people become consumed by greed or sexual appetites or self-centeredness. That's what's going on here. And this passage is a call to a disciplined life. Everyone needs to contribute. Yesterday, the session and the discernment team, and the discernment team are the folks who are helping through the transition to, and they're helping to discern what is the, the mission and the vision statement for the church moving forward. We met to do more of that discernment. Why does Grace Presbyterian Church exist? To do what? What is the passion? What is the work that makes your soul sing? What makes you want to give your all and to what? I think a better question may be to whom? Do we want to give our all? And what is the Holy Spirit inspiring us to do? But each of us were given talents at birth and through the Spirit have been given gifts and we are called to use them. Some people discount their, their talents or, or they don't know what they are. But believe me, God has given all of us talents and the Spirit will give us gifts to use to the glory of God to build up the kingdom of God. Use them, or you don't get any food in the fellowship hall. In the book, The Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis, a devil briefs his demon nephew Wormwood in a series of letters on the subtleties and techniques of tempting people. In his writings, the devil says that the objective is not to make people wicked, but to make them indifferent. This higher devil cautions Wormwood that he must keep the patient comfortable at all costs. If he should start thinking about anything of importance, encourage him to think about his luncheon plans and not to worry so much because it could cause indigestion. And then the devil gives this instruction to his nephew. I, the devil, will see that there's always bad people. Your job, my dear Wormwood, is to provide me with people who do not care. Wow. What do they say? The opposite of love is not hate. It's indifference. I thought C.S. Lewis said that. Um, He was not the first Austrian psychologist. uh, I have no idea how to say it. Wilhelm Steckel who first wrote, first wrote it in an article, The Beloved Ego, Foundations of the New Study of the Psyche. And, and by the way, the summary of the, of the C.S. Uh, Lewis uh, screw tape letters was written by Dan Valinga, but I found it in a blog by Richard in- Innes. And I, I just took a course on, I had to take, every two, three years you have to take a boundary training for, for clergy. And this one included copyright laws. So I am doing my work and letting you know, attributing as I need to. We all have work to do. And when we are doing the work that God intends for us, we will know great joy. It can be exhausting, but it will also be fulfilling. The other passage that we read in Isaiah, that lovely vision of a new heaven and a new earth, in it we read what God intends for us. And there's God's work and there's our work. Our work They will build houses and live in them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. When I work with pastors, I often ask, okay, what is your work? What is the church's work? What is God's work? When we have a mission statement and a vision statement, 
a future story will be written for the session to approve and the congregation to assent to. We'll know we've got it right when heads start nodding and people say, yes, yes, I'm willing to sacrifice time and energy for that. For all of you who work in organizations and you know when you're working with people and you want to gauge people's energy around a certain idea, because I've been in meetings where people say, where everybody goes, oh, that's a great idea, but then nobody steps forward to lead it. You know, you know everybody, that is a great who, you know, kind of like who's going to do it. Here's, I was taught this by a friend years ago, the five finger test. Have I done this with you? I know I've done this with side groups. Yes, five. I love that idea so much, I'm willing to lead it. Four, I'm not going to lead it, but I will, I will help. I will help the leader do it. Three, it's a great idea. I will show up for that program or that event or whatever it is. Two, I don't have, I'm not opposed to that idea, but I'm, it doesn't really interest me. I'm not, you know. One is, I don't think it's a great idea, but whatever. Zero, I hate that idea and I will oppose it, right? So whenever you're in a meeting and somebody, oh, that's a great idea. Okay, who's five fingers in? A, mission, a good mission and vision statement will have people going, yes, yes, and I will sacrifice time and energy to make that happen. Things that have been happening in the church and I didn't ask anybody's permission, but since we're, since we're doing these things. But Emily is all in on crafting and has hosted crafting events. Last month we met, eight of us were there, four people were not from the church. Woo-hoo! Right? Elaine Fiblin and Lauren Meyer are all in for seniors. They're organizing a Christmas luncheon in December. Five fingers. Jackie, Bob, and George are all in leading for the charge to renovate the manse, and there are a host of four-finger people to help. You heard the former Mesh, the Friends of Grace, who are so excited to be engaged in a feeding ministry. Uh, Choir is having a soft start coming up. Next week after worship, they're going to meet at the piano, right, to prepare a song for the following week, the first. Can you, we're at Advent already, kids. I don't think I've ever said that before, kids. All right. 27th, they're, they're going to sing during worship. Woo-hoo. And I'm, I'm all in for writing the, the children's pageant for the kids, which is my favorite three, three hours of the year, is when I sit down and write the play for the kids. We also need to acknowledge that some of the gifts and talents that God gives us, we can use. It doesn't have to be under the umbrella of Grace Presbyterian Church. Where you are and you are serving in the name of Jesus Christ, the church is in ministry. It does not have to be under the umbrella of the church. And there's lots of wonderful things that we can participate in. And the church needs to shift from, you know, it has to happen under, you know, be sponsored by the church in order for it to be ministry. No, we're all in ministry wherever we are, and there's lots of wonderful things. Our church is in ministry wherever you are getting your hands dirty in the name of Jesus Christ. And the other thing I need to say is that there's sometimes... Um, I had a conversation one time um, with a loved one who was blasting, you know, people who who you just come for worship on Sunday morning. And I told him the story of Phyllis. And I said, Phyllis, her husband has dementia, and she's the caregiver. Her mother-in-law is in living independently up in New England and 95 years old and she has to go up every other weekend just to make sure there's food and it's clean and the house is still standing and phyllis has a daughter who has to come to addiction and she's trying to to make sure that her grandkids stay out of foster care the fact that she makes it to worship on sunday is a miracle And the reason that she comes is to be fed so that she can go out and pour herself out for her family the rest of the week. We don't know everybody's stories. I can, I, I, I am marvel at what people are carrying around when you really ask. 
at seminary years ago, I said to some of the international students, I said, I've lived internationally. If you have any questions about the culture, because there's always, you know, living in a different culture, just ask me them and I'd be happy to answer. And this one guy, and he was from Yugos Hun Yugoslavia, Hungary. Yeah, one of those places. And he said, Robin, people ask me, how are you? And then they keep walking. What do I do? And I said, you just say, fine, and you? And keep walking. He goes, they don't really want to know. I'm like, no, they don't really want to know. But I continue to marvel that when you do actually have that conversation with people, how are you really? I am blown away by what we are all carrying around. Blown away. We don't know everybody's stories. And we can do this, yeah, fine, good, thanks. You know. But when we take the time. So I hope that we all have work that gives us joy that's fulfilling our souls. Next week, we're gonna don't, we are going to dedicate our giving, our financial giving for 2023 in worship. I think it's important that we pray about it and, and make it a, a ritual within the life of the church. What we are, uh, say, pledging, but the, in modern, life can turn on a dime, so estimates of giving what you think you'll be able to give in the next year. Uh, pledging, we, moving away from those words just because some, some people feel, well, I pledged it, and then somebody loses a job, and some people will feel like compelled that they have to give. No, 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 if life turns, we get it. But so what you, what you prayerfully believe that God is calling you to give, we're going to dedicate that in worship next week. Uh, but this week, just want to lift up that churches, ministry, doesn't happen if people don't give, you know, dedicate their hearts, their minds, and, and their hands to the, to the ministry. So I, I would have you be in prayer for both of those things. Is the Holy Spirit whispering in your ear something, a gift to, to bring to the table, an inspiration for how the church should be in ministry? How is God calling you to use your gifts to support uh, the ministry of Grace Presbyterian Church? I read at the end of our retreat yesterday, this is from a, a book of blessings, To Bless the Space Between Us by John O'Donohue. And I think this is a lot nicer than if you don't work, you don't eat. And this is a blessing called For Work. May the light of your soul bless your work with love and warmth of heart. May you see in what you do the beauty of your own soul. May the sacredness of your work bring light and renewal to those who work with you and to those who see and receive your work. May your work never exhaust you. May it release wellsprings of refreshment, inspiration, and excitement. May you never become lost in bland absences. May the day never burden. May dawn find hope in your heart, approaching your new day with dreams, possibilities, and promises. May evening find you gracious and fulfilled. May you go into the night blessed, sheltered, and protected. May your soul calm, console, and renew you. In Jesus' name, may we all be so blessed. Amen.